Okay, uh, thought I'd come back to Hebrews 3 here. Um, so, we saw we're partakers of the heavenly calling. And Christ is the apostle and the high priest of our profession. And in that role, he's actually, that's how he builds the house. He's the faithful son over his house. According to the Davidic covenant, it was promised that David's seed would build a house for God. And this house we are. We're the habitation of God. We're the temple of God. And Abraham and the prophets and uh, we all look forward to the new Jerusalem, the city whose builder and maker is God, Zion, uh, which is Jerusalem, the mother of us all, the everlasting covenant, according to Galatians 4. Uh, it's our home and our origin. And when it says we have eternity set in our heart, uh, there's something in the people that believe that corresponds with our home. We're homesick strangers. Um, but the church is something special because we get to experience the building in this age. Uh, and in the millennium, we'll be the first to be manifested as the fulfillment of what the building is, which will be the transformed living stones uh, that have been glorified in the image of Christ and radiate his glory and express him. And that's what the New Jerusalem is. It's this great sign at the end of the book of Revelation that sums up all the positive themes in scripture with God being the center and the content and man being the expression as the wall of all the transformed living stones that have been built up, represented by the gates of the city, which are like pearl and have the names of the apostles representing the church, and the corners, the, the foundation stones, uh, represented by the names of the tribes, which is Israel. And that represents God's heading up of all things in heaven and in earth, uh, in Christ, through his two branches, the heavenly being the church and the earthly being Israel, in a new heavens and a new earth with new Jerusalem at the center and God at the center of that, dwelling in man, his temple and his habitation. And that is the bride, the wife of the lamb. Okay, but the first group to be to the praise of his glory to to express this will be the church which is caught up into the heavens uh, to meet Christ before he comes openly uh, and is transfigured changed in the twinkling of an eye glorified putting on their heavenly incorruptibly incorruptible sorry image that is made up of the building work in this age by the incorruptible materials, the precious stones, the gold, the silver, and the precious stones mentioned in 1 Corinthians 3. You know, everyone, there's only one foundation that can be laid, which is Jesus Christ, and everyone needs to take heed how he builds on that foundation. You can build with wood, hay, and stubble, or you can put, build with gold, silver, and precious stones. Well, if you're a builder with the incorruptible materials, um, you're actually building with Christ himself, supplying him as life and grace to believers to edify them, and you're one with Christ in his role as the apostle, the high priest of the profession. Uh, you're actually cooperating in the ministry of Christ, the New Testament ministry, which is him building himself into man by revealing himself through the word. Uh, but he has ministers. And that's what Ephesians 4 was about. You know, um, he when he ascended, he gave gifts to men, uh, gifts to the body, which are apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, and teacher. 
And those gifts are not for the world, for the lost. No, the evangel. All those gifts are given for the body of Christ, unto the uh, perfecting of the saints, unto the work of the ministry, um, till we all come or, unto the building up of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of faith, the full knowledge of the Son of God, and to the measure of the stature of the fullness that belongs to Christ. And that fullness is the building work. Uh, the, or the result of the building work. It's the habitation of God and Spirit that he mentioned in Ephesians 2. And we've been talking about, I know this is really complicated, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm trying to speak to it from a high level. We've been talking about how we are his house if we continue in the faith. And that is not talking about losing your salvation here in Hebrews. That's talking about being built up and edified. And if you look at 2 Corinthians 5, which is a sister passage to 1 Corinthians 3, it is another passage about building. It talks about how we long, we're groaning in this tabernacle, this earthly tabernacle that's going to be dissolved. We have a habitation from God from that's uh, heavenly that we're going to put on and that mortality be swallowed up by life. That habitation is... Um, the transfigured glorified body that is the result of Christ being wrought into us through the New Testament ministry. You know, the New Testament ministry is not just words, but it's power. You know, you, you say, well, I changed my mind after hearing Ephesians and Philippians and Colossians all laid out, and I have so much more peace now that I understand Romans and Galatians, and I don't wrestle with the condemnation that I used to because I'm grounded in the truth. Well, that's true if you look at it intellectually, what's happened. Because your mind's been renewed and you know how to stand before God and, and be at peace and you've reconciled yourself to the gospel. But that happened through ministry of the word in the apostles' writings that's now been open to you and all of that renewing of your mind took God wrestling with you and dealing with your concepts on the one hand but on the other hand he was revealing Christ to you through his speaking and remember Hebrews is a book about God speaking in the sun in this new atmosphere and the sun is the effulgence of his glory the impress of his substance and when he speaks, he actually, it's the word of life, which is light that comes to us. He actually shines on us uh, the knowledge of his glory. So the gospel is not coming to you just in word. It's coming in power to reveal God. And 2 Corinthians 4 says that, our, uh, yeah, that God who called light out of darkness has shined in our heart to illuminate the knowledge of gl the glory of God. Uh, illuminate the knowledge of his glory in the face of Jesus Christ in us and he's talking about the New Testament ministry there that reveals Christ which is said to be a ministry of spirit and life and righteousness With, and it has an eternal weight of glory that never passes away that's wrought into us while we look not to those things which are seen but to the things which are unseen for the things that are seen are temporary and the things that are unseen are eternal. The New Testament ministry is not just speaking about Christ. It actually, we believe this by faith, is working a weight of gold, a weight of silver, a weight of precious stone into the believers to make them uh, edified now, strengthened now, empowered now, resting now, at peace now even though they're going through various trials that the trying of their faith which is more precious than gold which perishes would be found of praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ why is it going to be found of praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ because it's gold and it comes forth manifested as a as a precious a building of precious stone and silver and gold uh, of incorruptible material Right now, we don't see it. But if you're built up and edified, it's more than you think. 
It's, it's everlasting. It's eternal. You may not feel edified tomorrow, but if you're under the hearing of faith and you're being supplied by the Spirit, there's more happening than just changing your mind and being at peace. You're being edified. You're being built up unto the fullness of God, into the habitation of God. And you're experiencing Christ dwelling in your heart now by faith, but you're also having something deposited into you more and more and more, a weight of glory that will not fade, that will be revealed in the next age, in the millennium, as the glorious building of God put on display with your new body. Whatever your new body is going to look like in terms of shine and configuration and how glorious it is apparently has to do with how much you're edified this in this age and it is in that way a reward uh not only is it the reward of those who are edified but it's the reward of those who partake in the new testament ministry to edify and that's why paul said you are our epistle uh an epistle of christ you're manifestly an epistle of christ written in our hearts and known to all men what he's saying is that the writing is on the heart of the minister who received the comforts and the revelation in the first place who is also refreshed in being able to speak of these things so that and then uh so that's written in his heart but then um the believers themselves are another copy because they're an epistle of christ and they're built together somehow and somehow they're going to be conf uh, knit together and expressed in the next age as a unit um, of glory. <laughs> you know, whether it's a corner of a wall or some building stones that have been put together, the relationships are eternal. Even if we don't really know each other that much, if we're partaking in this process together, there's something being built together. And this is what what building is unto you know this is the city whose builder and maker is God and Israel will eventually partake of that too based on whatever God does with them in the millennium but this is our time and our manifestation will be initially more glorious because we will be heavenly and transfigured when the earthly mortals the Israelites enter their land to receive their blessing after the tribulation They'll also have received their raised, resurrected people like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Their graves will be opened, and they'll dwell with their people in the land. Uh, and they'll be glorified in a sense, but it'll be a different kind of glory, those resurrected saints, from the heavenly company that is conformed to the image of Christ and glorified during that time that uh, comes back with him from the heavens and reigns on the earth. Uh, and and rules the nations with him. Um, our hope is different, and our trajectory is is different for now. And we are partakers now of something heavenly. As partakers of the heavenly calling, we're partakers of this building. And so it's a big deal to not be edified, uh, and not to edify, which means I've. It comes out of neglecting God's speaking, which again is not just in word. It's the radiance of his glory and the impress of his substance. We said that in, um, you know, the exact representation of his nature in Hebrews 1, 1 through 4 is the character, whatever that Greek word is, which is an engraving tool that God uses to impress into us Christ and conform us to his image and shape us according to what he wants by actually revealing Christ to and in us as a weight of glory. See, again, we think I'm really encouraged today by Christ. That's more significant than you know. It's a really big deal to be encouraged in the Lord and to, and to enjoy the fountain of life and enjoy the benefit of your salvation and have confidence before God and to 
to come near by faith in the blood, near by faith in the blood, and actually make that step towards God with confidence in your rights as a son and an heir is the result of being edified, and it shows that something's already been wrought into you. You received some light from the truth of who Christ is and what he's done that has emboldened you and strengthened you and empowered you to go, thank you, Lord, for the blood. Thank you that I can come in. Thank you that I am in the presence of God. Thank you that I'm no longer in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in me and thank you, I can set my mind on the things of the spirit. And I thank you that the spirit bears witness that I'm a child of God and an heir. Thank you that all my sins are forgiven. I've been transferred out of the kingdom of darkness. I'm standing in the light. I'm accepted in the beloved. I have the forgiveness of sins. I'm raised up and seated in Christ. My life is hid with Christ in God. Christ is my life. I'm dead to the law. I'm dead to the demands. There's no condemnation for me. I am free. Thank you, Jesus. You could say that. You've already been strengthened and empowered by the high priest who's been interceding for you and supplying you with himself as bread and wine. Because remember, Melchizedek comes with bread and wine. To, not to remind you of his sacrifice for sin, but to celebrate the spoils of the victory that he accomplished. Uh, and as he does that, he's the apostle of your profession, which means he's really the one who revealed it to you and declared it to you. And he's declaring it in your declaration in the heavens. So, and it's that, that profession is Abba Father. It's intimate. It's the fact that I can say God, Abba Father to God who is my father and be intimate. And yet it's also a profession, a declaration of Christ uh, to the angels and to the principalities and to the world. I'm not defeated by my situation. I'm raised up in power. And that's available to every believer through the knowledge of Christ for free. For free. There's no cost involved. It's come drink freely. But the one cost is that you have to be willing to let go of your old concepts of Christ as the hard taskmaster and the law as your schoolmaster to lead you to him, uh, or w w you know, through meriting by your performance some blessing from him. When ac in actuality, the law drives you out of his presence. Uh, by reminding you of your sin, shutting down your conscience, making you afraid, putting you under condemnation. It's a ministry, it's an administration of death. And you have to be willing to count that as loss, count that as refuse, count that as dung for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. Because the knowledge of Christ is everything. It's the way God is carrying out his program. It's the way he builds you up. It's the way that you become the reward of the one who per, who had some participation in your edification, like the apostles, and you you gain your shine <laughs> for for some way that's going to be reflected forever. But it's of grace, you know. Even though there's a reward, it's not our reward. It's Christ's reward. It's the travail of His soul. It's His work that he's receiving his reward for when we are all gathered to him and he says, behold, I and the children you have given me. It's his trophy. And and an eternal weight of glory. You say, well, I'm not going to have very much glory because I've only been encouraged five times. You know, most of the time I was miserable. But you're a partaker of the heavenly calling and it's an eternal weight of glory. That means every drop of it, every part of it, is incorruptible and unfading. And if it's incorruptible and unfading, that means it's more, it's of more worth and preciousness than all of the treasures of the world empires heaped up together. If you could heap all the treasures of Greece and Persia and Egypt and Rome and now this world we live in and put them in a huge room and say I've got all the treasures and you're like the dwarf king in the hobbit you know where he's got he's sitting in all this gold and he's just unfathomably rich if you put all that together 
it would pale in comparison to one drop of the living water that works in you this weight of glory you were purchased with the incorruptible uh, the, the blood of Christ the spotless blood which is more precious than gold and silver and your faith is incorruptible uh, the precious faith um, which is more precious than gold which perishes those tried by fire will be found to praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ and you are regenerated unto a living hope unto an inheritance incorruptible and unfading reserved in heavens for you and uh, you are regenerated of the incorruptible seed of the Word of God all of this is incorruptible and precious beyond compare even though we've got Bible everywhere and everybody should know it's precious and rare more precious than any treasure in the universe all heaped together because eternal outweighs uh, anything corruptible and not only that but incorruptible means you will enjoy it forever and I've used the example of like um, iPhones and iPads you get a new one and within five minutes you're annoyed you wish you hadn't even opened the box you know uh, you're ready for the next model that'll configure itself uh, there's absolutely a dissipation in any pleasure we have on, about anything in this age it's all fading away and vanity but every drop of the incorruptible inheritance will be thoroughly enjoyed and enjoyable for eternity that we can't even understand that we've never enjoyed anything for more than an hour you know uh can you imagine smiling so much that your face hurts for eternity? Well, it would if you weren't incorruptible. It, the joy unspeakable and full of glory. Crowns of everlasting joy on our head. Don't worry about how much you're going to shine. That just puts you under law, righteousness. You know, I need to shine more. No, just be edified by... See, this ministry of the New Testament which comes to us from our apostle and high priest who's faithful over his house uh, who supplies it through the gifts the apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, teachers who in turn perfect the saints unto the work of the ministry unto the edification, the building up um, this ministry uh, is the revelation of the hidden wisdom of God and hit, wisdom hidden in a mystery which neither eye has seen nor ear heard nor has it entered into the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him and the the spirit we see we've received not the spirit of the world but the spirit which is from God that we may know the things that are freely given to us from God which things we speak not in words of natural understanding but spiritual things combining spiritual with spiritual that the natural man can't receive but we speak it among those who are being perfected um, and the spirit searches out the depths of God to reveal these things to us so it's not a small thing to know who you are in Christ and what you have and to even avail yourself of it and stand confidently before him that comes from a strengthening supply of the spirit in the speaking of God in son through the ministry which imparts him as life and as a weight of glory that's written and a speaking that's written on the heart of the ministry and in you so that you're an epistle of Christ an expression for eternity with a writing that never fades and it's a writing that impresses him into you as a weight of glory that never fades. So this is building. And this is what he's faithful over his house to do. This is the profession. It's The profession is fun because it's all the good things that God is doing and has in store for us. And our understanding unfolding. Um, and it makes us bold and confident to come to him. That's how you know you're edified is are you confident before God how do you know there's a ministry you know the uh, 
pastors say it's because we got X amount of people and they're all tithing and most of them are obeying God. No. The way you know you have a ministry is how confident are the saints because they're being equipped and the way you know they're confident is because they're not dwelling in condemnation nor are they trying to work for a wage. Uh, and they have joy and peace in Christ, in the knowledge of Christ. He fills us with all hope, joy and peace in believing and he establishes us in him. Okay, so that's the building of the house. And it's through speaking. Um, and then it says, therefore, the, this warning, uh, today if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. In the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. Therefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, they always err in their heart and they've not known my ways. So I swore my wrath, they will not enter my rest. Now that speaks of people who did not believe. Uh, on the one hand, there were people that came out of Egypt that didn't believe the gospel. They just wanted to be associated with the people of God. And it turned out they weren't even believers. But that mixed multitude degraded the atmosphere of everybody. And their unbelief permeated the camp to where everybody started complaining and saying, did you just bring out here to die? And they didn't enter the land, which represents the rest. Um, and they were hardening their heart and always erroring in their heart and have not known his ways. They saw his works, according to Moses, but not his way, they didn't understand his ways. They saw all the miracles. A lot of people think if we just had, you know, during the kingdom, everyone will believe because all we need is all these miracles and then we'll believe. That didn't work in the wilderness and that didn't work in Jesus' day when he did all the miracles. They'd say, okay, what sign will you show us that you're the son of man? After he multiplied bread and fed 5,000 people, the Pharisees said, what sign will you do today to prove that you're... So, no, the, that, that kind of stuff doesn't produce faith. Only the speaking of God and understanding who he is in the gospel actually produces faith. And uh, a lot of people harden themselves against the gospel every day and instead believe lies. Um, and these are not unsaved people. These are saved people who were rescued from Egypt and should be in the good land, which was only an 11 day journey, incidentally. Is an 11 day journey from Egypt to the good land and that yet they spent 40 years in the wilderness. Why? Because they didn't believe they could take the land and they couldn't be convinced even though they were justified. And that's how many believers live their life. They just will not be edified. They will not pursue the truth. They will pursue sensationalism. Uh, they listen to the truth as one item among many entertaining things, not understanding its value and dwell in condemnation, uh, dwell in misery and complaining, and dwell in uh, dwell in wondering or not if they're going to the lake of fire or not, or am I getting in the rapture or not? And that's how they live their life. Miserable, wish they had never been born, but maybe they'll get to go to heaven, and wondering if they're really going to get to go to heaven or if they're just going to get punished. That is a really, really low place for a believer who is a partaker of the heavenly calling to believe, to be. And it's the one way we can grieve his heart. You know, there's only two mentions in the New Testament of grieving God. And both of them are related to this kind of persistent unbelief. In second, in Ephesians, we talked about this last time. Ephesians follows the same map as Hebrews 3, Ephesians 4, which it, it talks about the profession and the work of building, and then it talks about not grieving uh, God. You know, it talks about how he gave apostle, prophet, evangelist, shepherd, teacher for the equipping of the saints unto the work of the ministry, unto the building up of the body of Christ, edification, until we all come to the unity of the faith and the full knowledge of the Son of God and the perfect man, and that we're no longer like babes tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, by the cunningness of men who lie in wait to deceive. We're not like that, but speaking the truth in love to one another. We're growing in all things into him who is the head by means, uh, being richly supplied by means of the joints and the bands. You know, we're, it's a totally different atmosphere because of edification, because we're receiving the word and 
in Ephesians, then it says, therefore, you know, you're a partaker of the, the calling. Walk worthily of your calling. It says, and put on the new man. Um, and don't walk according to the futility of your mind as the Gentiles. Uh, being darkened in your, their understanding and without feeling. And, and don't grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed under the day of redemption. Uh, and it has to do with, are you walking according to what you've seen or have you seen anything? It's all about the futility of the mind and not being renewed and not being edified and therefore not walking unto the building of the body of Christ. You only care about yourself and, and that can manifest itself in a lot of ways. It can manifest itself in wanting to build your own ministry and not caring about the building work of God. And that's what pastors do for the most part is they go and pursue their own ministry in the futility of their mind. They're not edified and they don't know how to edify and everything they say tears down, you know, uh, I'm talking about the law oriented pastors, the works ones that say, you know, you got to get to work God or else you're not going to get a reward and you're going to get beaten and punished. You leave this church. God only knows what's going to happen to you. They do not, even saying that they're denying the shepherding work of Christ and the high priest and all, all of his roles in the believer's life. And they say, well, what about our role? We're here to discipline you and tell you what to do. No, you're not. You're here to nourish us with Christ and warn us about things that would distract us from him, including all these works programs you're trying to get everybody involved in. Um, but anyway, to grieve God, he's using Israel as the example in the wilderness, but he's not saying that the effects are the same. And see, because the language is so strong, uh, we tend to think he's talking about we're going to all fall in the wilderness and die and never be saved. No, he's talking about you're not going to enter rest. You're not enjoying Christ. You're miserable. And as a result, the only alternative to enjoying Christ is to be falling back into law, righteousness, and dead works, and misery, and complaining because the carnal mind is hostile to God. You know, believers who are justified but not edified and refuse to be edified and refuse to heed the voice of God and his, his present speaking end up becoming very bitter. They're the worst people to be around. Um, they're just angry. They're angry at God. They're angry at everyone around them. Uh, and they have a very miserable view of the Christian life and they pretty much just watch Rapture channels or tribulation videos and get morally outraged at everything in the world. So the whole thing is going to hell in a handbasket. I'm, I'm not obligated to do anything in this world except sit and complain. You know. <laughs> but anyway, um, that's the kind of person that's going to grieve God's heart and provoke him and see his works 40 years of supplying manna because they could never get into the good land and where the riches are. The day that they got into the good land, the manna ceased because there's all these riches. When you're living from miracle to miracle, it's because you don't really live in a consciousness of the provision of God. You've got no freedom to do anything or put your hand to anything. You're just walking around in the wilderness hoping to get some manna every day, you know? Uh, but anyway, take heed, brethren, lest there be in you an evil heart of unbelief departing from the living God. And people say, well, that means you lose your salvation, you walk away from God forever, and you're not even saved anymore. No, what it's saying is that God is in the holiest. The whole point in Hebrews is that God is in the holiest, and we have access by faith into the holiest through the blood. And we have to be edified to exercise our right. We, otherwise, we will shrink back in fear. And so all through Hebrews, there's a contrast between shrinking back under perdition, shrinking back in fear, not coming forward, staying on the milk and neglecting the great salvation and not availing ourselves of Christ and not coming forward boldly because we're not edified versus coming forward through faith in the blood, knowing I'm a son and an heir based on my position in him, even if it means I'm outside the camp suffering and everybody's saying I'm lazy. I don't care anymore. If all the religious people are saying, you're just looking for a license to sin out there with all those Jesus people, you need to get back to the temple and tithe and do the sacrifices. No, 
I'm going to suffer outside that kind of reproach outside the camp with Christ. I don't care about what you say because what I have is so much better. That's the whole argument in Hebrews. That's why Abraham went, uh, you know, he could have, he could have been something big in Ur of the Chaldees, but he left because he saw the city whose builder and maker is God. That's why Moses, uh, forsook being a prince in Egypt and enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season, um, to go endure the afflictions with God's people because he saw a vision. He knew why he was going out, you know, and we should know why. See, uh, a, a unsaved person gets saved because they see something of Christ in the Passover and they go judgment's coming and I've got to get out of here and so they put the blood on but that's about all they know then in the wilderness they're supposed to learn they, they forget that God called them and said you're coming to a feast they didn't know that all they knew was Pharaoh's chasing me I gotta get out of here angel of death is coming get me the Passover blood get me through the Red Sea get me out of here Okay, that's how a, a, a new believer or someone on the milk of the word thinks about everything. It's just a matter of survival. They don't even remember God said there's a feast, you know. Uh, but when we get, when we grow in Christ and we get established from the, we go from the meat of the word, wondering about eternal judgment, repents from dead works and faith towards God, and we start thinking about the high priest within the veil who's there for us to supply us with all the riches of this salvation, which is called rest. And it's the riches of the good land, and it's the holiest with God himself available to us as living water and Christ our high priest. And we cease from our own works, and we rest in God, and he begins a new work of the new creation and raises us up in power to be edified and to walk confidently before him. And not only that, but our speaking becomes a fragrance of Christ. In those who are being saved, it's life unto life. And we start becoming epistle writers. And we start becoming partakers of Christ. That's what he says. Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you of un evil belief, heart of unbelief, uh, departing from the living God, but exhort one another daily while it's called today. Now that is speaking to one another in love. Lest any of you be hardened, through the deceitfulness of sin, for we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it said today, if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some, when they heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But who was he grieved with? Was it not them that sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swore he? Did they not enter his rest, but those that believed not? So they could not enter because of unbelief. We go, well, that means he's talking to unbelievers and th there's f fake believers among us and they're going to perish. That's true. But he's talking about partakers of the heavenly calling who are believers. Therefore, let us fear, lest a promise being left of entering into that rest, any of you should seem to come short of it, have the appearance, because we don't come short of it ultimately. We'll enter in when we are glorified. But what about today? For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those that heard it. Now this can be talking about unbelievers, but it's not. Because he said, therefore, brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling. And in every one of the warnings here, you can see through this book that he's always talking to believers and he always follows it up with encouragement. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he said, I swore in my wrath, if they enter, shall not enter my rest, or if they shall enter my rest, though the foundation works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spoke in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, God rested from the, all his works, and in this place they shall enter my rest. Uh, he's going to get into an argument to say that, look, there's a rest that remains. He's actually arguing against people that would say, I'm just speaking of eternal salvation here. No, there's a rest that remains for the people of God. Now, the people of God are not unbelievers. The people of God are the partakers in this age of the heavenly calling who have the right to enter rest. Most of the people who died in the wilderness had the right to enter rest. Moses died in the wilderness, and he had a right to enter rest. Uh, but in terms of he's, he's an heir. He's one of the people that God justified by faith. But there was unbelief that kept them from enjoying that rest, and it's always today. 
So he's going to make the point that there's a rest that remains for the people of God who are the believers today. And it could be that you seem to not enter into it because don't get bitter. You're getting persecuted. People are calling you lazy, good, no good for nothing antinomians who won't go to church. And you go, well, what's there out here? There's nothing. Because, and the reason you think there's nothing is because you don't value the speaking of God and you haven't gone on to the meat of the word. You haven't tasted the goodness of what's been supplied to you. You're not even interested in spiritual things. You're hardening yourself against God, provoking him, calling him the hard taskmaster, saying, did we just bring us out here to die, even though you're a believer and you're a partaker of the heavenly calling. So to partake of Christ here, where he says, we become partakers of Christ. Um, to partake of Christ, if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Now that word already showed up, confidence, right? Because he says, whose house we are. Um, he's, he's a son faithful over his house. Whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing hope of the hope firm to the end. Same thing. He's speaking about the same thing. He's speaking about believers who've received the gospel, who need to go on from the milk to the meat of the word to stop thinking about just, am I going to like a fire or not, and actually get past it. And he's going to really strengthen his argument in Hebrews 6, that the milk is like the rain has keep coming down and keep coming down, and yet you're only bearing thorns, you know. Why aren't you go going on to the meat and the real blessing of the gospel. You're still focused on these elementary principles of the doctrine of Christ, eternal judgment, baptisms, and uh, repentance, and faith toward, from dead works and faith towards God. And that's where most believers stay. They go, they go in a cycle of hardening their heart, opposing the gospel in reality because they refuse to admit that there's no condemnation for them and they refuse to come near. They won't give heed to the voice of God uh, in the gospel They'd rather argue against it and wallow in their feelings and in their fears and in their condemnation and their misery, saying, did you just bring me out here to die? Is the rapture coming soon? You know, I do hope for the rapture, and I think it is soon, but my hope is very different than the guy who thinks that, that when Christ comes, he's going to beat him because he's not working hard enough. And so he's buried his talent knowing I knew you were a hard master, so I took what you gave me and I buried it, you know? Uh... Because he doesn't have a rejoicing, he doesn't have a hope that's brought him into the presence within the veil, so he doesn't know Christ. He's saved by Christ, but the Christ that's coming to him, save him will be a stranger, and he'll be surprised at how good he is. Uh, and that's a person who never entered rest and never partake of the milk of the, the meat of the word and never was edified, never built up because of an essential hardening every day to the speaking of God while it was called today, because there's a rest for the people of God. See, this is not talking about eternal salvation. This is talking about something that still remains for the people of God to enter into every day called rest, which is associated with building, being edified, which is the source of confidence and strength and rejoicing of hope. That rejoicing is built on receiving the word. There's no rejoicing if you don't receive the word. And yes, there's a ministry behind it. Okay, the high priest, he's got all authority in heaven and earth and yet he can't overcome you if you harden yourself to the uttermost and absolutely refuse to be encouraged by the word ever <laughs> he will wrestle with you and wrestle with you and wrestle with you but you can grieve him while he does and still never benefit from the ministry you can be saved and never enjoy christ you know and to partake of christ is not it's partner with him the word is partner with. And so it's not just enjoying him. It's actually participating in the building work. Because if you really enjoy Christ, it will come out. It really will. Somebody's going to be encouraged by being around you. And that encouragement is a bigger deal than we think. It's not just you change their mind or they change their mind. It's Christ got wrought into them. Okay, I have to go. Um... I, tr I knew I had a very short time, so I tried to, like, machine gun blast this out. Uh, hopefully it made sense. I know these were really kind of lofty concepts. Uh, sometimes I just need to let it rip, you know? Um, all right, take care.